Brett, welcome to another run through of the top five charts of the week. This is a free email that goes out to subscribers of the website. Anyway, starting off with number one, this is global consumer confidence versus global equities, and actually also the global manufacturing PMI. So you can see there the black line or the sort of dark grey line there, that's the global manufacturing PMI that peaked around the turn of the year and has been falling since. You could say that it's possibly stabilized at this point, but you look at the uh, where consumer confidence has been tracking, so that's uh, a global composite there, the blue line, and that's actually been going, just, you know, going from strength to strength. Bit of volatility in that indicator, but if you smoothed it, or you sort of squint a little bit, then you can see that you know there's definitely been a bit of a divergence there. Global equities, the line in red, that's uh, the MSCI ACWI, All Countries World Index, in local currency terms. That one had also kind of been diverging from the manufacturing PMI. I mean, that one had peaked at the same time, so there's some similarity there. But you look at the chart, and it just seems to be this sort of divergence there. And um, pretty much there's, there's two ways that you can look at that. The first way is, from a pessimistic view, is that the PMI is right and that we're going to see more drawdowns in global equities and that you know the consumer is just going to have a delayed reaction to that. And the more constructive view is that the PMI has stabilized now and that you know the level of global equities consumer sentiment is more on the right side and that we're going to see perhaps some reacceleration there. You know, I think that we'll probably find the truth somewhere between those two views. But anyway, like the, the the reason I really wanted to highlight that chart is because although the PMI has slowed down a bit, it's still well in expansion zone. And you know, you look at that chart, you don't see a collapsing economy. You see a little bit of a growth wobble in the PMI, but other than that, you know, there's sort of a it's one it's one of uh, a number of positive signs that we're looking at and you know looking to highlight as well because it's important to keep those kind of data points and facts in mind when you're going through a bit of market volatility like we are at the moment. <clears throat> Number two, cyclicals versus defensives. Now this one's a really key one and quite um, in keeping with the previous topic really. Now, what we've got here is the MSCI cyclicals versus defensives indexes. So that, you know, the stocks that are more sensitive to the cycle versus those ones that tend to be a bit more defensive. And I think this is a really key chart. And this is one reason why I think that, you know, going back to that previous chart, is that we'll probably see a bit of both, um, you know, the gap closing because of equities catching down and the reason there is because you look at the US cyclicals versus defensive line there and basically you know it's a good old catching down there you see emerging markets line there had been deteriorating for you know since late last year actually and there's a couple of there's an interesting points I'd make on this one. I mean, you could just say that this is just completely just the Fed, because if you think about it, emerging markets tend to suffer, um, you know, faster and more severely from Fed right rate hikes, Fed tightening, quantitative tightening, than the US does. And there's a few reasons for that. Currency is a big one. <clears throat> and there's also the fact that EM borrows a lot in US dollars. But anyway, you can see that, that, that you know, EM has been under pressure. And if that is right, that the Fed is driving that, then it's basically, you could say that the weakness in the US line is down to a delayed reaction to the Fed. That's really important because if that line catches all the way down, that's going to be, you know, in terms of the S&P 500, we're going to be seeing, you know, much deeper drawdown. 
if that were to take place. And that's the kind of thing that would actually make this, the Fed go slower. I mean, you could actually make the case that this chart is the reason why the Fed is going to pause. Or at least, you know, maybe take things a little bit slower. Um, so in that respect, it's a really, really key chart. Um, in terms of the technicals there, so yeah, aside from that divergence, um, bearish divergence there, you can see that the US cyclicals versus defensive line there, the black line, is put in the head and shoulders top. What you can't see is that the 200 day moving average, it's broken down through that as well. So I were all looking um, pretty sketchy really, and you know, I would say that this is probably one of the biggest risk areas. But then of course, if it does drive the Fed to actually stop hiking, or take a break, then that's the kind of thing that will, you know, become less of a headwind for US markets, but much more to the point, that could be the kind of catalyst that would turn emerging markets around, which are starting to look very interesting from a valuation standpoint. Anyway, I'll leave it there for that one for now. Number three, bank CDS pricing. So this one is a showing the average five-year CDS for both US and European banks. Um, so a couple of things here. First of all, you'll notice that European banks generally trade at a higher um, risk premium versus US banks, and um, I think that's probably just lingering issues from the crisis. Makes sense. Um, but more recently, probably more interesting aspect is number one, US banks have been, you know, risk pricing there. So CDS, that's credit default swap, it's basically a market-based measure of risk pricing. For US banks, it's been quite low and contained and, and quite tight risk pricing. And uh, that makes sense when I mean, the economy is going strong. You don't tend to see issues when the economy is going strong. It's when the economy slows down that issues start to uh, sort of rear their head. But European bank CDS has been pulling away from there. And you can see there that there's been this sort of little uptrend. The concern about that is that basically you see these kind of indicators explode either suddenly or gradually. And then suddenly. So sometimes, you know, you can just get this spike just completely out of the blue, but then a lot of the times you do actually see just a slight uptrend before an eventual sort of blowout, like like throughout 2015. It was um, gradually trending upwards, and then, you know, in 16, there we had that spike. And that's what I'd be watching for here. The reason why this is trending upwards is. Well, big one is lingering political risk. So, and there's three things going on there. There's Brexit, there's Italy, there's Germany, the elections there. And there's also some softening in the economic data, or certainly the economic confidence data. And so, you know, I wouldn't dismiss the risk there. So, you know, as constructive as I was trying to be with the first chart, um, you know, add this to the previous one, it's a different issue, but there's, um, you know, we're not in a world without risk, not by any means. Number four, USDCNY versus policy rate differentials. So really just look at the headline of that chart and that kind of says it all. Policy rate differentials make renminbi to valuation the path of least resistance. So what do we mean by that? The red line there is the difference between the PBOC and the Fed uh, benchmark interest rates. And why would you look at interest rate differentials to drive the currency? Well, it's a good question because, you know, you always want to make sure that there is some actual sound economic logic behind, you know, correlation kind of charts like this. And, well, for starters, there's just a straight you know, incentive aspect. So if one currency has a high interest rate and the other one has a low interest rate, what you generally tend to see is that carry traders will 
borrow in the low interest rate currency and invest in the high interest rate currency. And so, um, you know, you have that interest rate differential driving a carry trade or at least driving preferences. Um, if, the you know, the, the, the more that you move on that differential, the more that the exchange rate will tend to move because the exchange rate will reflect the flows that, that um, you know, that'll drive in terms of um, relative preference. The other thing is it just um, reflects the state of the economic cycle, the monetary policy cycle. And um, that's particularly true and particularly relevant for this particular exchange rate or this pair of countries. So China's economy is in the middle of a cyclical slowdown. Very clear there, very clear. And US economy is just going from strength to strength. So when you have economic divergence and you know you typically see that flow show up in um, monetary policy divergence as well, which is certainly are for these two countries, and that tends to um, drive a lot um, of what happens with the exchange rate. So that's why I think um, you know that it does go to that sort of mythical or a problematic or psychological 7.0 mark. Um, you know, there is perhaps, you could argue, a bit of politics standing in the way of that. Um, the trade war, of course, is going to be a key variable in this. I try to look first at the data before trying to delve into um, speculating on politics. I've got a reasonably constructive outlook on the trade war, but you know, if it does deteriorate, then of course um, this is a lever that the, the policymakers in China can pull. And from you know the way that they sell that to the global community would be just to say, well, we're just letting it go where the fundamentals are taking it, which you know, look at charts like this and says up. Now the problem with that is this here last chart, number five, which is US dollar index, EMFX, so this is a 25 currency equal weighted index that we've built there, and Asian currency index, which is 10 different current Asian currencies equal weighted again on the left hand quadrant, and USDC and Y on the bottom, left, on bottom right chart there. Now, if you look at these, uh, you should be able to pick up on something that's going on across all four of these charts. They sort of, they're all interrelated of course because the the Asian currencies and EMFX then they're, they're, they're taken against the US dollar but um, you know if you look at the US dollar index itself that's basically G10 or developed market currencies. But anyway, the point I wanted to make there is that if you do get a rise above 7 for the USDCNY, that's going to be the type of thing that's going to drive another round of weakness for Asian currencies and emerging market currencies. And if that happens, then that's going to drive additional demand for US dollars because that's basically going to, uh, you know, certainly dampen risk appetite. And then that's going to have a sort of circular effect and... The risk there is that you see another sort of surge in the US dollar index and you know if you look at the US dollar um, still got substantial yield support it's not particularly overvalued um, so you know this definitely is a possibility that it does have another round of strength that's the key risk for emerging markets at this point and another issue for the Fed because of course if you have that other round of US dollar strength it's the kind of thing that's going to um, going to, it'll, it will one way or another make the Fed go slow. Uh, the most direct way would be that, you know, the stronger dollar is going to cause lower inflation through the import channel and therefore the Fed doesn't need to hike as much. Um, the other one is that it just causes so much issues that you have that sort of hit to economic confidence and then that could um, also cause the Fed to be a bit more uh, prudent given um, how far it's come already. So I'll leave it there, but uh, you know, if we were to summarize a couple of common themes, there's uh, 
there's still a bit of risk out there, I guess, is probably the main common theme. We saw that in the prospect for global equities to catch down to the PMI, for US cyclicals versus defensives to catch down to EM, the trend up in European bank CDS, and the possibility for the USDC and wider go above 7. But then we also talked about two key potential reasons, this one here, and the last one, the currencies aspect that could drive the Fed to uh, just sit back and take a little bit of a break.